Hello, it's Scott Manley here. Now, the last few years of uh, rocket watching have been really kind of fascinating. What with SpaceX and their Falcon 9 kind of changing the landscape. I mean, it's been fascinating to watch the excitement that they've brought with them and their great rockets. And in a few years, they've basically eaten up a huge part of the commercial launch market. And with their stage recovery and reuse, they're changing the math that has driven the cost of rocket launches. And SpaceX even have fans, which is really strange in a world where you're just launching payloads into space. But, you know, people are really excited in the same way that they're excited for sports teams. But the old school rocket companies, they still want to sell their services. And they are eager to talk about what things they can do better than SpaceX. And it's not just marketing. There are legitimate engineering and physics reasons why you might use a rocket other than the Falcon 9. Now, the Falcon 9 has made many design decisions in the name of reuse and in the name of simplifying production. In particular, it uses the, almost the same kind of engine between the first and the second stages. They use nine Merlins in the first stage, and on the second stage, it's essentially a Merlin, but with a much larger vacuum-optimized nozzle. The Merlin engine runs on kerosene and liquid oxygen, a proven fuel which is dense and performant, but... Delta and Atlas are the, pro the two main competitors in this space. They use a more efficient hydrogen-oxygen upper stage powered by an RL-10 engine. And the RL-10 engine is much more efficient. The United Launch Alliance loves to point out that the impressive low-Earth payload advantages of the Falcon 9 begin to tail off as the payloads need to go into higher and higher orbits. Now, you can actually quantify this by going to the NASA Launch services program they have a website that lets you plug in numbers for your target launch orbit for whatever spacecraft you're hypothetically building and it'll tell you which NASA approved launch vehicles can manage these and their payloads so this is the launch vehicle performance comparison website so for example we can compare circular orbits 28.5 degree inclination which is the minimum you get out of Florida and look, at 400 kilometers, you can see the payload that uh, some rockets manage. And then you can look at the payload that you get, say, at a 2,000 kilometer orbit. And you'll notice that I've got four rockets on this chart, right? We have the two different, two different Falcon 9s. One is essentially returning the booster to the launch site. And the second is returning the booster to a barge. Obviously, a barge recovery gives a huge boost to the amount of mass that they can put into orbit. But the other lines are for atlases. You've got a 401, which means no boosters attached, and the 411, which adds one little booster on the side, and it has to, of course, power slide off the launch pad like a pro. You'll notice that the, uh, the lines for the Falcon 9 have a steeper gradient, which means at a certain altitude, the amount of mass a Falcon 9 can put into orbit becomes less than the atlas for that... Uh, for that altitude. What this is showing is that that high energy upper stage powered by hydrogen loses less and less as you need more and more velocity. You see, the RL-10 gets a specific impulse or an efficiency is what, what we would think of it, but 460 to maybe 470, depending upon the exact model of RL-10 engine, whereas the Merlin vacuum engine only gets 348 seconds. So this directly translates to velocity. If you have the same mass of dry mass of vehicle and mass of fuel, then the hydrogen engine on the, Atl on the Atlas, the RL-10, will get 30% more velocity from that same mass uh, vehicle ratio. And where this really becomes untenable for the Falcon 9 is escape trajectories. That's when the orbits are essentially going off to infinity and traveling off to other planets. I mean, I say infinity, but it's essentially a long way from the planet Earth. And we can essentially treat the effect of the Earth as if it were at infinity. So instead of measuring a typical orbit here with, you know, peri perigee and apogee, you're talking about the escape velocity. And we're really interested in the escape velocity as it leaves the sphere of influence of the Earth. So they talk about something called characteristic energy. That is the square of the velocity 
when the object is escaping gravity, the gravity well. You use the square, incidentally, because it's kinetic energy. Uh, you know how you get the energy by squaring the velocity and multiplying it by half the mass? Well, you know, you can cancel out the mass, and it turns out that if you have a spacecraft moving at a certain velocity at a certain altitude, you can subtract out the potential energy it would need to reach a certain to reach infinity, and you end up with the square of velocity at infinity. But trust me, all you need to know is that the higher the C3, the harder it is to reach. And the Atlas becomes really competitive. In fact, it becomes it becomes superior to the Falcon 9 for even low-end escape trajectories. The recently launched Mars InSight spacecraft had a C3 of 14.3 kilometers squared per second squared. It was launched on an Atlas 401. That's the smallest, wimpiest Atlas launch vehicle that doesn't get any help from its SRB friends. Now, that launch vehicle could handle a two-ton spacecraft, at least according to the NASA site, and get it up to that uh, C3 requirement. The Falcon 9, with a drone ship landing, could only put 1,500 kilograms into that trajectory. So it's barely within the capabilities of the Falcon 9, because the InSight spacecraft was lighter than that. So, of course, what SpaceX are pitching to NASA for interplanetary spacecraft is the Falcon Heavy. And they haven't just delivered the specs for a regular Falcon Heavy with full recovery. They've also included expendable options on the Falcon Heavy, which I'm going to say look pretty impressive. But just let's look at the recoverable version. If you take the Falcon Heavy, uh, you know, regular recovery mode, it's superior to even the heaviest of Atlas V's until you have a C3 requirement of about 12 kilometers squared per second squared. So yeah, at that point, the Atlas 551 will begin to outperform the Falcon Heavy. But if you say needed to go on a direct flight to Jupiter, that would require a C3 of 75, and Falcon Heavy actually cannot get that. Its payload goes to zero and below. And that's the, the reason is, that upper stage is just too heavy. Even with the fuel and no payload, it cannot get that fast. It just runs out, you know, even its dry mass is too low. But yeah, SpaceX have given NASA the numbers for the Falcon Heavy. And in the expendable mode, well, I'm going to say it's not clear how expendable they're talking, whether they're expending all three stages or whether they're recovering the boosters on drone ships. Because they are, they are building a second drone ship to uh, catch two boosters at once. But anyway, the numbers on this site are very impressive. Theoretically, it's more powerful than a Delta IV, all the way up to a C3 of 100. And if you remember earlier this month, Parker Solar Probe, when it launched, there was some discussion as to whether Falcon Heavy could have done this. And I was very skeptical, given the Delta's you know, reputation for performance, reliability, and its pure, lean hydrogen diet. But it turns out the Falcon Heavy doesn't lose out to Delta IV until about 100 kilometers per second. Per second, 100 kilometers, yeah, look, 100, which is very big. And for reference, the Parker Solar Probe uh, was about three tons when you included its Star 48 upper stage. And it needed to get boosted up to a C3 of 60. And if you look at that line on the chart, yeah, the Falcon Heavy could have happily done that in expendable mode. So yeah, according to NASA's own numbers, the Falcon Heavy could have done this, but it didn't obviously because, well, Falcon Heavy is too new, it's still experimental. And guess what? The numbers on the NASA site are entirely theoretical at this point because we have had a Falcon Heavy launch, but it was a Falcon Heavy that used a mixed Block 3 and Block 4 uh, cores, and it was used in recoverable mode. So we haven't tested a fully expendable Block 5 Falcon. So these numbers, fascinating, but uh, we're not guaranteed these are ever going to be true. Definitely interesting. Uh, I'll also point out that that test flight for the uh, Falcon Heavy, that did send Starman and his Roadster off to Mars. The C3 in that case was about 10. And actually, that's way lower than would be predicted by NASA's page right now. And I think the main difference here 
is that they updated the page to account for Block 5, and this was an older thing. Apparently, back when Falcon Heavy did its test launch, people pointed out that the NASA Launch Services page was still using Block 1 numbers, so it was looking kind of lousy back then. So look, why doesn't SpaceX have a high-energy upper stage? I mean, they did look at it. Back in 2010, they started letting on about something called Raptor, which back then was described as a hydrogen-oxygen engine. And at some point they asked the Air Force if they would be interested. Uh, then somehow Raptor morphed into a methane or methane liquid oxygen. And uh, they're actually getting money right now from the Air Force to develop this stage, although it's not clear that this will ever actually turn into a working product. Uh, the funding just covers developing a prototype for the Raptor. But look, okay, we get the energy thing. That's all very cool. There are other small ways which SpaceX has a, doesn't have the advantage, let's say. And uh, there's a great picture from Tori Bruno, head of the ULA, who uh, tweeted out this image of uh, payload fairings. And the payload fairing on the Falcon is tiny. Yeah, the Falcon Heavy has exactly the same payload fairing size. And it's about, you know, 40% smaller than the fairings available for the Atlas V or the Delta IV. So if you have a large payload, sure, you might need the mass of a Falcon Heavy, but you would actually have a very hard time fitting many payloads, uh, many large payloads into that uh, fairing. Instead, you might have to go with an Atlas V or a, a Delta IV. I believe that Bigelow Aerospace's space station has to go with an Atlas V simply because the SpaceX fairing is too low. There's another uh, factor that there are some payloads that cannot be integrated onto the rockets in horizontal mode. So when you're building rockets, the SpaceX like to assemble the rockets on the side and bolt the sections together. They'll raise them up to vertical without a payload and then do their static fire and then bring them back down and bolt on the payload fairing. But the NRO, they have some payloads which they still require be attached in vertical orientation only and do not get placed on their side. Now, I have no idea what these payloads are because they're classified, but it is known that they require this feature and only ULA with their big uh, rolling buildings are able to actually do this at this time. Again, NRO is giving SpaceX some cash to actually investigate doing vertical integration. We don't know if that feature will ever come along, but uh, yeah, it's another, another thing. So look, my whole point here is Always temper expectations. Yes, on paper, you know, you can come up with numbers that says your rocket can do this, your rocket can do that. But real world requirements may sometimes preclude your first choice. You might have other options, you might have other requirements, and you might simply need the most reliable rockets. And still at this time, despite SpaceX being very cheap and very good, they've had two big failures, and that does tend to uh, compromise their value a little in terms of in the eyes of people that are putting one-of-a-kind payloads up there. Having said that, obviously things are only going to get better from SpaceX's point of view and it's also going to be interesting to see how ULA's Vulcan flies and how it changes the equation at all. And of course, you know, Blue Origin are still talking about their new Glenn spacecraft. The future's bright, the future's interesting. I'm Scott Manley. Fly safe.